All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 40th Annual Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Thank you to the panelists for offering your insights on, and experiences on the topic of universal access to water. My name is Catherine Loden. I am a conference co-director, and I will be moderating this panel. I just have a few announcements before we get started. Just some tech information. Don't worry if you can't see yourself. This is a Zoom webinar, so all of the attendees are automatically muted with your videos off. You'll only be able to see the panelists. Throughout the panel, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. All of our panelists will be giving their presentations, and then there will be a 15-minute Q&A session at the end where the panelists will answer your questions. Please remember to be courteous of all viewpoints during the presentation and Q&A session. Additionally, if there are any legal professionals in the audience wanting to use CLE credit for this panel, we will provide you with a link to the document with information on how to do so. Also on this document is information about how to make a donation to the Public Interest Environmental Law Summer Stipend Program. Our alumni board, Friends of Land Air Water, helps to provide summer stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law work. If you are interested in making a donation to help provide students with those stipends, information on how to do so will be on this document, so watch out for that link. Lastly, the University of Oregon is located on the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, the Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the Coast Reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their community at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Polk would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people in the Willamette Valley and express our respect for the tribal nations of Oregon. I will now introduce our panelists. Dr. Alexandra Cassivi is a postdoctoral fellow at University of Laval and a sessional lecturer at University of Montreal, working on drinking water supply and domestic hygiene in low resource settings, such as low and middle income countries and remote northern communities. She holds a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Victoria, Canada, her research expertise lie at the crossroads of environmental engineering, public health, and geography. She worked as a consultant with World Bank's Water Supply and Sanitation Group Solution Group, and as an intern with the Water Sanitation and Hygiene Unit at the World Health Organization. In 2020, she received a Green Talents Award as one of 25 young scientists with high potential in sustainable development by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Professor Heather Tanana is a citizen of the Navajo Nation and an assistant professor and Wallace Stanger Center Fellow at the S.J. Quinney College of Law. She holds a Juris Doctorate from the University of Utah and a Master's in Public Health from Johns Hopkins University. Heather is experienced in state, federal, and tribal courts and clerked for Judge Nuffer at the U.S. District Court for the District of Utah. Heather's research interests include exploring the overlay between environmental and health policy, promoting better practices in Indian child welfare and criminal justice in, Indi in the Indian country. Over the past year, much of her work has focused on Water and Tribe Initiatives Universal Access to Clean Water Project. The project seeks to bring awareness to the lack of clean, safe, and reliable drinking water in Indian country and to make tangible progress on securing water access for all Americans. Heather serves on the boards of Urban Indian Center in Salt Lake and Western Resource Advocates. She also volunteers her time on other work groups to promote diversity in the legal field, including the Rocky Mineral Law Foundation Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, Association of American Law Schools at Section on Indian Nations and Indigenous Peoples, and the American Bar Association Native American Resources Committee. Finally, Dr. Crystal Tule Cardova is a principal hydrologist in the Navajo Nation Department of Water Resources Water Management Branch. She has worked collaboratively with Navajo Nation partners on water-related research since 2013. Her work pre-pandemic focused on protecting and managing water resources in the Navajo Nation. And since the start of the pandemic, her work has shifted to providing access to safe water for Navajo residents. With that, I will turn the conversation over to the panelists. Attendees, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A function as they arrive. Dr. Kasibi, if you are ready. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, you should be able to. Okay. Oh, it says I'm not allowed to share my screen. Okay, just one second. <laughs> 
Jesse, if you could give her that function. Oh, you should be able to. Um, okay, do you see full screen or just the presentation mode? Just the presentation. Okay, sorry. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it was right before we didn't see the notes. Like I can't see your notes. Okay, so it's okay right now. I think so. <laughs> okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, so thank you for having me on this panel. I'm really glad to be here today. So I'll be starting off by talking a little bit about access to drinking water uh, in low and uh, resource settings. Um, so I have a very short presentation, so we can just go uh, with the other panelists after. Um, so I first want to invite you to just think a little bit about what access to drinking water means to you, because um, this is a concept, a definition that varies depending on where we live, perhaps, or even what type of uh, water supply we do have at home, if we have water treatments or if we have pipe water, it, it really depends on where uh, we are and what type of access we do have. So what does it actually mean um, to have access to water? Well, there's um, different definition for it, but at the global scales, uh, different definition are used, uh, especially by the, um, international organization to monitor access to drinking water and to have good estimates on how many people do have access, how many people lack access to water. And so there, um, this definition of safely managed drinking water, which is used uh, since the beginning of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, in 2015. And so we have different later of access that are defined. So as you can see here, we have uh, on uh, your left, so the scale um, in terms of access. So safely managed drinking water would mean that people uh, have access to drinking water from an improved water source that is accessible on premises, available when needed and free from uh, fecal and priority chemical contamination. So we have different concepts in here. So we are talking about uh, accessibility, quality, but also quantity of water. So people do have in general, uh, safely managed drinking water. So as you can see on your left, uh, uh, on your right this time, uh, safely managed drinking water at the global scale, so worldwide, is about 71% of the uh, global population. And if we go down a little bit, we have basic access to drinking water, which is having access to an improved water source. So an improved water source really is a technology. So we are talking about um, covered wells, for example, pipe uh, water supply, or perhaps public tap as well, um, that provide collection time uh, in less than 30 minutes round trip for people who collect water. So that would mean having basic access to water, uh, it would mean that people would walk less than 30 minutes to access water. So maybe in your head you're thinking, well, that is not access. Well, that is a definition that is uh, sometimes used to measure access to water. And so we assume that people uh, do have basic access uh, when they have this type of access. And so we have limited, unimproved, and surface water in the different categories. Uh, so we, in terms of limited, that would be people that walk further than 30 minutes to fetch the water, and unimproved water source that is uh, unprotected uh, dog well or unprotected spring. And we also have people that are using surface water. So we're talking about lakes, for example, or rivers. So that really means having no access to a certain type of technology. 
So for um, maybe you uh, in the United States or uh, other people in Canada, uh, we generally have access to safely managed drinking water. Uh, but this is not something that is granted in all the communities. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about um, today. So what you can see on your right uh, on the graph is that when you take into account the different uh, factors, so in terms of accessible on premises, available when needed, or free from contamination, so quality, quantity, and accessibility, we see that the number of people with access uh, actually increase. Uh, and we are talking about improved access to water, then we have almost 92% of the population. So if you're aware of the Millennium Development Goals, that was the actual definition that was used to uh, monitor progress in terms of access. So that was having access to an improved water source. So um, when we have um, access, then things uh, is, are generally easier, but when access to safely managed water is not provided, then we can ask ourselves, uh, what are the different challenges associated to a lack of access? Uh, so in different contexts, then we have different uh, challenges, of course. So in contexts where people do have to fetch the water, then we can think about um, access maybe in the dry season or access in the rainy season. Are we looking at different things? And do we have good quality of the water at the public tap? But what about access to a good quality at home because you know sometimes when people do collect the water then there's contamination on the way and so we we are looking at less um less in terms of quality of water when people do consume it at home. Um, and so we have those issues but also we have different issues in communities that are served with uh, track to cistern and I will uh, talk just a little bit about that today because uh, I think the other uh, panelists are going to talk about it as well um, but uh, in terms of low contacts then we have we can think about uh, low and middle income countries where pipe water is not available but also indigenous communities uh, humanitarian emergency or refugee camps um, as well so um, in, uh, in Canada, um, more specifically, uh, just to put a little bit of context, um, in Northern Canada, uh, we have um, this area that is called the Inuit Nunangat, um, which is a land of the Inuit people um, here in Canada. And um, in Northern Canada, there's uh, different issues that relates to water supply because uh, of the permafrost because we are in a, an area uh, in the Arctic where uh, it is very, very difficult, expensive um, and challenging to uh, implement water supply, so pipe water supply. So we uh, end up that we end up with many communities being served with tanker trucks, so truck to cistern. So we have those kind of supply. Uh, so we have a water treatment plant and then the water trucks uh, and it fills the different cisterns that we find in houses or public building as well. So as you can see uh, in the Inuit Nunanga um, that account for 51 communities, 80% uh, of those communities are served by uh, truck to cistern. And that is actually something that most, uh, maybe Canadian or most people um, don't know uh, because in Southern Canada, uh, almost all the communities are served uh, with pipe water. So it is often inimaginable to think about the fact that some people are served with uh, truck to cistern in Canada. Um, so just uh, quickly, the different uh, challenges that are associated to those kind of water supply um, with cistern trucks. So we have different challenges that relate to the production of uh, drinking water to the distribution, storage, and also people preferences and practice uh, that relates to uh, their access to water. So water leaves the water treatment plant, goes into trucks, and now we wanna make sure that the quality is good again. So if we, we go back to the definition I was uh, talking about earlier, then we can 
um, make some, some link here because the quality of the water um, is monitored when it leaves the water treatment plant. So we are not even sure what's the actual quality when the water stands in the cistern in uh, the different uh, houses or public building. Um, so those challenges uh, are really important because uh, we also have issues of quantities, and if quantity is missing, then we have domestic hygiene issues, which leads as well to health issues, with our, which are, are also very, very important. Um, so those different challenges are important, and um, they relate to a lack of uh, access to uh, drinking water. So after uh, this, or even after the, the other presentation, uh, yeah, I invite you to just think about your, your use of water and how you perceive this, if uh, it's actually something that you, you maybe take for granted that um, having good quality of, of water, always having water at home, uh, because that is an issue um, that many, many people do have to live with uh, even today. So I will um, stop here uh, to leave um, the stage to the other panelists, uh, but the main challenge is really to ensure good quality of water and sufficient quantity of water uh, from, the, from the water source to the point of use uh, so that people do have uh, good access. Um, yeah, so I, I will leave it here. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask uh, after the other presentation or email me um, as well, if, if you prefer to do so. Thank you. Mm. Wow, what a great kickoff to our session. So I'm gonna go next if I can, if someone wants to make me a host. <laughs> um, and so what our next two presentations are going to do is focus on here in the United States and in Indian country. And I'm gonna talk more broadly about the challenges tribes are facing. And then um, we're really fortunate to have Dr. Tolik Cordova go next and really focus in on Navajo Nation specifically. So can you give me a thumbs up? It's always an issue with Zoom. Are you seeing the presenter or the, <laughs> the screen view? But yeah, so yeah, hey everyone, really happy to be here. Um, as mentioned with my introduction, uh, much of my work over the past year has focused on water access with tribes in the United States with uh, the Water and Tribes Initiative. And it was the pandemic, right, that really brought national attention to the challenges that tribal communities were facing. We saw tribes like Navajo Nation, like White Mountain Apache and others across the country just hitting insane um, infection rate, right? Uh, early study came out from the CDC that American Indians, Alaska Natives were at least 3.5 times more likely uh, than white persons to get COVID and the outcomes were much more severe. And so a lot of concern uh, for family members and associates that we knew uh, who are still on the reservation um, about the health and welfare of them over the past couple years. And again, early research coming out that was showing this correlation between those high COVID incidence rates that Native people were facing with lack of indoor plumbing. And a really great report came out, um, I want to say 2020, uh, from US Water Alliance and Dig Deep, where they found that Native American households were 19 times more likely than white households to lack indoor plumbing in the US. And there's a few other studies out there that also connect that this is not um, an issue of being in rural locations. It's not a socioeconomic status. It is about race and Native Americans are suffering the most. And it's a challenge though, that our tribal leaders in our communities, we've all known about for years, right? I'm sure Crystal's gonna tell you stories. You go down to visit, you know, I go to see my, my cousin, um, lives right outside of Gallup on Navajo Nation. My kids are saying, hey mom, you know, auntie, where, where do we go to the restroom? Yeah, there's an outhouse out back, right? They didn't have plumbing water coming into their home. And so, Tribal leaders uh, have long known about the challenges that their people were facing 
and at the same time have also known about the incredible importance of water, about how it's necessary for life and for communities to thrive, and that the federal government has a unique responsibility to uh, Native Americans in the United States based off of treaty and trust responsibilities. Heather, uh, we're seeing presentation mode. You might oh. want to switch just to let you know. Yeah, I know. Now then you can see what's next. And it's not as like anticipating. Let me see. Ah, this is always a challenge. Sw swap displays. There we go. OK. Uh, yeah, so something I like to do we're not, and, being, okay, now it's coming up. Yeah. yeah. It's still in presentation <laughs> mode. Oh Sorry. Uh, there we go. Thanks, there Chris. was just a request from the audience. Okay, is that, there we go. Is that it? <laughs> All right. Okay, so something I, you know, okay. Challenge, tribal folks, we knew about it. Why is this still an issue here in 2022? Well, part of that is the lack of education and awareness for broader Americans across the United States. So every time I do a presentation with a general group, you know, that's, I know I'm not speaking to tribal leaders or, or you know, um, other indigenous people, I like to gauge their knowledge. And so I'll ask. Sorry, sorry to bother you again, Heather. All we see is a white screen. Are you? <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> But just because we have great uh, visuals. I know. That's so crazy. Okay, let me try. Um, sorry, folks. So sorry that's happening. Let me try this mode. Sometimes this works. Um, I can do it this way too. Uh, let's see. Sorry, and, and while I'm tired, I can just keep going because I know we have such a short time and, and crystals is really great too. So, so gauging your background, just do it this way. And then I don't have to rely on crazy PowerPoint. Um, I like to ask people, and I don't know if the whole, if someone can center my screen or, you know, you can change your settings. So my screen is the biggest in your viewpoint and maybe that might work. Um, but, you know, I ask folks, how does the, yeah, change your view to speaker mode. How does um, the United States Declaration of Independence refer to American Indians, right? And you might think, oh, maybe the indigenous people of this country or something like that. Well, no, it's merciless Indian savages. So think of like such an important document in our country's history. And right from the beginning, that is the relationship with the federal government and the indigenous people in this country. And another common question is, you know, how many federally recognized tribes are there in the United States? You can have federally recognized by our federal government. There are also some states that have state recognized where they may not be recognized at the federal level, but they are at the state level. And then there are many tribes who are not state or federally recognized, but they were indigenous people of this country and are seeking that recognition. How many federally recognized, right? 574 distinct federally recognized tribes today. And then just ask yourself, right? The state you're in listening in, do you know how many are within your state? I'm talking to you from Utah. Here in Utah, we have eight. So those kind of simple things um, you know, if, if you didn't know all of those answers, I'd encourage you to, to think about it, learn about it, take the opportunity, because the past in the United States, those past federal policies and actions, they are critical to why so many Native Americans lack piped water coming into their home. And if you do a little basic federal Indian law 101, you often learn about these different eras in the United States. And the takeaway I'm gonna leave with you is that each era was based upon um, the general Anglo-Caucasian male-driven ideas of how to be successful and trying to impose those on indigenous people to say, if you need to be successful, you need to adopt this Anglo-American way. And so it much focused on becoming Christians, 
and becoming farmers. And we're gonna take your land resources and important things at the same time. So these different areas, again, you can read about them. We don't have too much time to dive in, but that's the basic takeaways. Native people were often pushed off their land, pushed westward, told, told to adopt mainstream values that in the end very much harmed the communities so that we are dealing with historical trauma still today. And you can't separate out that past history and all of these traumas when you're looking at an environmental issue like lack of water or an environmental justice because they're all interconnected. And so, for example, I think many of us, the boarding school era is getting much more attention because Deb Holland announced uh, efforts, right, to investigate uh, the policies, look into all of the removals here in the United States, in part because of the hundreds of graves that were found up in Canada who went through the same experience. Of, and so for removing children from their families, sending them forcibly to boarding schools, many of whom never return, we are crippling communities. Who is going to be the future teachers, the future doctors, the future engineers? Because so many kids didn't come home. Who's going to be the future leaders? And so this really ties into what I'll get to in a minute of why tribal capacity um, is a challenge today. And based on the past federal policies, these actions that have been taken, the broken promises, really great report called the broken promises that goes through all these different areas and failures of the feds. You can pull it up later if you're interested, but this is what our communities are dealing with now. Limited health resources, food deserts, the water insecurity, housing shortages, right? There's supposed to be consultation obligations that have not been uh, followed. And so all of these, again, relate to one another, have, left tribes decades behind the rest of the country when we look at their communities. So I just had to take part of my lecture to, to go over that um, because I think it's so important. Anytime you're working with tribal communities, you have to learn about that history. You can't ignore it because it still has an impact today. So the rest of my time, I want to zone in and focus on water then. And I loved, um, Dr. Kasivi, how you asked that initial question of like, what does access even mean, right? Um, oops, go to the next slide. And for tribes, we talked with um, several different tribes in the basin to figure out what access means. And we found these different components. And certainly one of the most obvious ones is, right, is there a delivery system? Is a home getting this lacked water supply? And um, as I'm sure Crystal will really talk about, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the answer is sometimes no, <laughs> and particularly for Navajo Nation. So I'll let her go into the details and the challenges with uh, Navajo Nation and their water access. But beyond piped water, sometimes you have it coming in. And again, we heard this before, the quality is inadequate um, and it makes the water not usable. And Hopi is a really classic example of this, that their systems, when they were first put in by the Bureau of Indian Affairs back in the 60s, um, early 70s, right from the beginning, they were had high levels of naturally occurring arsenic. And so to some degree, that water, the contamination can be unsafe to use. And yet there are no other sources for the community to consume and so they're put, having to make a choice. Do I use this water that I know has health risks or do I go out and buy bottled water that's gonna be significantly higher cost or do I try and ration further, right? Real challenges here. And then what we found this third kind of element here was even if the quality is okay um, for now, the piped water system is there, Native American communities are the fastest growing population. We saw this with our census numbers recently about the increase in the number of individuals that are identifying as Native American. And so the infrastructure isn't keeping up with growth. Tribes are wanting to uh, build out and support 
the increasing number of members that want to live on their homelands and yet they don't have the, the adequate infrastructure to do that or so kind of talk, maybe talking q a later um you know the infrastructure isn't climate resilient and so it can't handle the additional strains of climate change and things like that and this is a fascinating little map here that we got from indian health service they have a sanitation facility construction program um you know their mission based again on treaty and trust responsibility is to provide health services to American Indians, Alaska Natives in the United States and recognizing that intrinsic connection between clean water and health, they have a sanitation facilities construction program. And this map, the bright red, those are areas where there is no <laughs> drinking water or sanitation system at all. So you see that Southwest corner and Alaska, credible challenges. And then as you go from orange to yellow, the um, deficiency is less severe where the yellow is uh, that the quality standards are still being met, but uh, the system needs routine repairs and maintenance. So, so yeah, but you can see it's, it's right. It's a challenge across the United States. Um, this is not something solely that we're dealing with in the Southwest. And then this last element of uh, when we talk about how do we obtain and keep clean water access um, is operation and maintenance support. And the, you know when a system is put in place, it has to be maintained. <laughs> and many tribes struggle to have that internal tribal capacity to run and operate their systems on their own, to have a certified water operator. Um, and without that though, you're threatening the future longevity of these systems. If you're not operating and maintaining them appropriately, it can fall in disrepair, you might not catch quality concerns, that sort of thing. And in Indian country, there are very few programs for operation and maintenance support to tribes. The Indian Health Service is the only agency that's really statutorily authorized to provide that support, but Congress has never appropriated funds for it. And so instead we have these kind of technical assistance programs like the US Department of Agriculture, Environmental Protection Agency, they each have kind of these technical assistance that can go out and train operators and things like that, right? But just not enough. And I will also throw out there one of the challenges when we're talking about going out and ensuring clean and safe water um, throughout Indian country in the United States is that there's so many different federal programs. <laughs> there isn't one place to go to do this. And yeah, this is just little, these are kind of the four, four big ones that are involved. You see, like I talked about with Indian Health Service, but EPA does a little reclamation does some when they're told to do so by Congress or in water settlements that might include an infrastructure project. USDA has programs. There's actually like over 21 different programs by over, you know, seven different agencies. And, and if you go to tribalcleanwater.org, that's where you'll see our reports and you can dive deeper into all these different programs. But up until now, and really still now, I just didn't fix this, there's different agencies acting on different authorities with uh, different expertise. And so it makes it challenging then to fulfill all of the community needs when we're trying to bring in a project. The other challenge is funding. Uh, the Indian Health, this is just their program for their sanitation construction. You can see the yellow is their need that they reported out each year to Congress. And the green is the level of fundings. At the best year previously, we hit a 10% funding level, you know, just a fraction of what they're asking for. And it is only this uh, very recently with the infrastructure bill that they received the full amount that they were asking for. So leading up um, the last couple minutes here, I wanna talk about the infrastructure bill then because it has changed things and really created an opportunity for us to make tangible steps in ensuring clean water access to Native Americans in the US. And 
you know, many of us on this project feel like it would not have happened but for the pandemic. That national attention that was being brought to these issues, um, you know, things like the Black Lives Matter, that as a country, we care about human rights more, we care about each other more. All of these things came together so that we were able to get a lot of support for water in Indian country. A Senate and a House resolution were introduced um, where they recognize you know, that first quote there that it is a necessary component of the federal trust responsibility. There's also great language in there about water being a human right, right? Necessary for the survival of our, of our people in this country. And then something that was really exciting was the Western States Water Council resolution. They recognized that same kind of similar language about a human right, but this bottom quote there that the settlement or adjudication of Indian water rights claim is not and should not be a prerequisite to providing water, drinking water to tribal communities. Because a lot of times I think before, um, and, and many people probably still do this, uh, is you think about, okay, let's get water to tribal communities and you automatically go to federal Indian reserve water rights, the quantification of what right water they're entitled to. Right? But we don't do that with anyone else. We don't say, hey, Phoenix, all the tribes haven't settled out their water rights in Arizona. We're going to cut off water to all your homes until that's done. Because we recognize that water, people need drinking water. It's such a small percentage of the water overall, right? And so that kind of support was really key to then getting the infrastructure bill passed that had these three main fundings for IHS, EPA, and reclamation that will be used to help provide clean water access to Indian country. Again, that IHS funding was critical, $3.5 billion that will be paid out over the next five years. EPA got money for their clean water and drinking water under the state revolving fund. So there are tribal set-asides. So those programs got you know, 23, 239 million each. And then reclamation. Reclamation is a, again, slightly different agency. They don't have a mandate to provide clean drinking water. They don't have a grant, well, really like a direct tribal program, but they come in when, for the most part, when Congress has directed them to build some. So we do have some like Hick Hickory, Apache Nation, um, had a law passed by Congress where reclamation was the agency responsible to put in a big infrastructure project. So they got money to finish up some of these rural projects and money also for future water settlements that again can include infrastructure components. So where are we going from here? Just keeping my time up. Um, I want we let's we can talk about this right we're gonna have challenges making sure that money gets out it's a lot of money how do we capitalize on it there are still gaps in funding like i talked about with the onm you notice UD, usda didn't get any money and um, climate change isn't stopping anytime soon <laughs> so how can we as we put in these new projects make sure that they are climate resilient projects and then that biggest challenge right how do we build up the tribal capacity so I will stop off there and um, turn it over to Crystal. Thank you for that. Let me go ahead and pull up my. Fingers crossed that it'll go into presentation mode. <laughs> I mean, well, the presenter, yeah. Um, so I think we're good. Thumbs up if you can see. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I'll be discussing a unique perspective where it's a tribe sharing our perspective, our unique water challenges and water opportunities. She'e crystal tuli kordova yonishia tuwadich yitli nishlin khat nezati bashish chin hash khan hed zoha e desha chay tuwo hei klini e desha nale. I said I am of the bitter water clan born for the Tangle People Clan, my maternal grandfather's clan is the Yucca Fruit Strong on a Line, and my paternal grandfather's clan is the water that flows together. And our clans are given through our matriarchal side of the family, and here I am with 
the matriarchs of both my maternal and paternal sides. And so even within our identity, water is so integrated into our lifestyle as well as teaching philosophies. And uh, here is my paternal grandmother with her youngest sister and with my son. And from a very young age, uh, we are taught what a not. And in English, it loses its meaning of what that really means. I mean, it, it's simply put water is life, but that's such a simple sentence to encompass what it really is, meaning our dependency and our connection with water. So we rely on water for the, the medicinal plants that we use within our ceremonies for the um, food that we grow, for the wildlife that may exist out there and that we're able to hunt. Uh, and, you know, everything from the vegetation on the ground across the landscape as well. Uh, and including, you know, more recently, we've included uh, sheep and different livestock into our lifestyle. And it's, uh, we wouldn't be able to exist. And it doesn't matter whether you're vegan, vegetarian, or you like to enjoy steak every now and then as well. Everyone is relying upon water. Even when you think about what you drank this morning, whether it was coffee or you relied on energy drinks or you drink water, all of those have uh, water a part of it. But it's important as Heather had described, you know, to have an understanding about the history because that history gives us a better understanding of why things they are today. And Navajo people experience huelte. It was the forced removal from our homelands um, and we had to march uh, and the amount of people that marched eastward were 11,500 that marched 400 miles away from our homeland to Bosque Redondo, also known as Fort Sumner. Uh, however, in 1868, uh, uh, that treaty it allowed us to be able to return to our homeland. And, uh, through that treaty and through the map that you see on the right and through Navajo advocacy, we are able to be as large as we are today um, as far as our land. So it's through not only that treaty of 1868, you can see where that initially started, but through different executive orders, our land grew to what it is today. And with that being said, uh, we span across Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. We also have fee land or, uh, that the Navajo Nation owns in Colorado. Uh, it's important to have an understanding about that force removal. And then you see three satellite communities on the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, we have Tuajile that's near Albuquerque, Alamo near Socorro, New Mexico, and Rama that's south of Gallup. If you've ever been on I-40, you probably passed Gallup. Uh, but just having an understanding of that force removal and as uh, Navajo people had set up, um, you may be wondering what these holes are in the middle. Uh, that's the Hopi tribe that Heather had referred to. And so when you, you begin to think about these intricacies of how tribes are in the United States, you begin to have a better understanding of why a large percentage of our tribe uh, has limited access to water via in their home through pipe water. Uh, what was mentioned also was the boarding school era and uh, Heather had described about the, the Declaration of Independence. And here we have Tom uh, Torlino, how he looked before he went to boarding school and how he looked after. And it's important to have this understanding about how people thought of indigenous people. And when you don't consider them as your equal, that provides challenges for the resources that are being acquired and being able to be confirmed for different parties. And that leads us to conversations like the Colorado River Basin, but also in other basins. Um, so the Navajo Nation spans across the Colorado River Basin as well as has um, portions of the eastern side of the Navajo Nation in the Rio Grande Basin. This map shows the basins and the subwatersheds that are within this area. And when you begin to think about how massive this is and the need to be able to secure water rights, um, given the infrastructure that is set up for the availability of water or lack of availability of water, it's important to have this understanding of you know, a nation similar in size to West Virginia or similar in size to Ireland 
having all these watersheds across the region and being in the West, you know, very, everyone's familiar with the drought uh, that continues to persist in this area. Uh, with settled water rights, we've had the opportunity to be able to develop water. Um, the New Mexico, um, we've settled for the San Juan water. It, it's an opportunity for us to be able to develop laterals that provide the infrastructure to distribute the water. Um, predominantly, we were relying upon groundwater mostly, but through water rights, we're able to build projects like the Navajo Gallup water supply projects to get wa surface water to communities that have water quality and production challenges with their groundwater sources. More recently, we've had uh, the Navajo Utah water rights settlement that was passed with the omnibus bill recently and um, have the funding that was appropriated for the settlement. Uh, these two examples, the Navajo, New, uh, the New Mexico San Juan is a project-based settlement. The Navajo Utah water rights is a fund-based settlement and that just gives uh, you know, a, a better understanding to people about how that infrastructure may be built where with the water rights for the New Mexico, it's a project that is promised for that settlement. And for the Navajo Utah, it's funding for projects that have been identified in the white paper that the Navajo Nation has produced. And the Navajo Nation, you know, I, I did describe its size and we are the largest land-based tribe in the United States, as well as more recently, the largest populated tribe. Uh, here is on the right is an example of where the Colorado River Basin is. The upper is in yellow, the lower is in blue. But when you begin to think about how management practices in the Colorado River occur, you and then you begin to think of a tribe, a tribal nation that straddles multiple states, multiple um, watersheds, and how those are managed, it really becomes a challenge associated with when you begin to settle these water rights and what you can use or what you can't use. As an example, um, we can't convey any of our New Mexico water into Arizona until we have settled our water rights within Arizona. Um, also speaking about the challenges that we have, we have a sparse population. Uh, census 2010, we had on reservation population of 173,000. More recently, our population both on and off the reservation is over 400,000. Uh, but when you begin to think about population and you begin to couple that with rural living, uh, this is a community called Blue Gap, Arizona. It's where my paternal side is from. And what you don't see from Google Earth are subdivisions and large developed infrastructure in this area. But instead, you see where my grandmother was from and you see the tree that was in front of her house. You see the traditional dwelling called a Hogan. And then over here on the upper right, you see her sister. And there's no cul-de-sac. So when you begin to think about developing infrastructure across this area, it's long water lines that need to be able to convey this water. You begin to think about the management practices. You have to take into account water aging, economics for developing water in these type of communities. But then you couple that again with something like legacy mining issues. And in the Navajo Nation from 1944 to 1986, nearly 30 million tons of uranium ore were extracted from Navajo lands. On the right, you can see where those abandoned uranium mines are. There's um, over 521 that are now mapped and located within the boundaries of the Navajo Nation. The Navajo Nation banned uranium mining in 2005. And when you look at that also, what you um, can have a better understanding about is and have questions about is what is the impact on water supply? And this is research that was done by Janet Ingram and uh, some of the students that worked under her at Northern Arizona University. On the left, you can see the unregulated water sources. Uh, and then with the X, you can see the abandoned uranium mine sites. And on the upper right, you're seeing um, a graph from 2002 and onward and then on the y-axis you can see the concentration 
The dotted line is the maximum contaminant level. And what you see there are, there are exceedances and these are unregulated well sources. So, you know, it's not within um, the EPA Environmental Protection Agency to be able to evaluate these water quality. But it's important to have this understanding because when people don't have pipe water, they rely on these type of water sources. And when you look at water, and let's say you have a bunch of water that is there, if it looks clear and doesn't smell, you don't really think that there's any problem with the water quality. But when you look at it and are able to do uh, analyte analyses, then you can be able to better understand just how uh, the water quality may be. In the Navajo Nation, this is a new tool that came out as well as a, a paper briefly describing the dashboard of the unregulated water sources. So this is a compilation of existing data sets on unregulated water quality, um, looking at a variety of different water types and being able to do different correlations using the data dashboard. Um, so in the Navajo Nation, our little department is small but mighty, but only through partnerships. And we're able to partner with academic institutions as well as federal government and state agencies to be able to build our capacity and build the resources because we don't have a lot of resources as well. Uh, so we also not only have challenges associated with water quality, just with legacy mining issues, but we also have it with um, brackish water. So high TDS levels, total dissolved solids, basically salty water. So we're partnering with entities like the University of Arizona to be able to work on off-grid uh, production of safe water. So being able to think about reusing that brine for something else, because you know if it's just waste and you have to transport it off, there's not a lot of benefit for that. But if you can be able to use that to also grow food in a food desert, which the Navajo Nation is, we only have 13 grocery stores, um, you have a better understanding and appreciation for that type of technology. Uh, we are also doing different evaluations with federal partners like the Army Corps of Engineers to better understand our water um, through watershed characterization studies. Uh, below the surface, we're partnering with USGS to be able to have a better understanding of the aquifers that we're relying upon and be able to see um, you know, what has been impacting uh, the water over um, time. And you know, we've had the Navajo Generating Station, we had the Navajo Mine, those recently closed. But having an understanding of the water quality is really important because both above surface and below surface water is important. We're partnering with academic institutions to better understand the recharge processes uh, within the mountain area, but across the Navajo Nation, we're partnering with scholars that are from our tribe that are helping us, although they may not live within the boundaries of the Navajo Nation, they use the resources that they have at their different academic institutions or companies that they work for to be able to assist us with different efforts. This is the map that you've seen earlier. It's the Navajo Nation homes without pipe water. Red and orange, yellow indicate homes that have more than 100 homes within these different communities. We have 110 communities throughout the Navajo Nation. Um, so you can gain a better understanding of, you know, how many people are impacted by not having running water and where are they located within the Navajo Nation. And now fast forwarding to the opportunities, um, financial opportunities, Heather had began to talk about that. Um, I'm talking about, you know, I'll be talking about CARES Act, um, uh, the ARPA, American Rescue Plan, as well as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and how Navajo Nation is using these resources to be able to help with um, pipe water supply. And the blue are uh, transitional water points, essentially where permanent water points didn't previously exist. The red are the permanent watering points, the yellow and the green are other um, Navajo tribal utility operated watering points or communities that didn't have a watering point because a large number of their um, community did have pipe water. Uh, but it was 5 million was allocated to the Indian Health Service and 58 transitional water points 
were constructed in these communities, these 58 communities, 58 of the 110 communities that didn't have transitional water points. There were distribution of water storage containers and there was distribution of 3.5 million doses of water disinfection tablets. And on the left are Larry and Jean. They're from the community that I live in. And every day that I work on gaining access for Navajo residents to have pipe water, I think about individuals like them who don't have a vehicle and use a wheelbarrow to, so that they can get water um, for their household. So under the American Rescue Plan Act, there are, are different funding opportunities. Under the Indian Health Service, there's an opportunity for potable water delivery. Essentially, that's providing um, bulk water supply delivery to Navajo communities. There was 2.7 million um, that was allocated to the Navajo Nation for this effort. Under the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, there's water delivery. And what's been identified under this um, is bottled water delivery, so 16.9 ounces or the gallon. And that effort is $3 million. Um, one thing to have an understanding about is funding guidelines under these different legislations really kind of tie the hands of how the money can be used because, you know, 2.7 million and 3 million together could provide a reliable water supply for developing a well and the infrastructure to um, provide more sec water security, but unfortunately the, the services, and fortunately because it is providing um, a stopgap measure for homes that don't have pipe water, uh, the Navajo Nation right now and yesterday even con continue to discuss what they would like to do with the remainder of their AMS American Rescue Plan Act funding that was appropriated to our tribe. And a lot of it is related to infrastructure, water infrastructure, electrical infrastructure, because when you begin to think about conveying that water across the land, you have to have electricity. And then the broadband is also an important aspect of it because of the automation that needs to occur for um, that sustainable infrastructure. We also have the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that has provided funding as well for this effort. Uh, there's that 3.5 billion for the Indian Health Service, and there's money that's been identified for tribal set-asides and um, for drinking water programs. For the Bureau of Reclamation, there's the opportunity for water under diff their different water smart opportunities, but also there's that 2.5 billion for Indian water rights and uh, Navajo Gallup water supply project, as well as the Navajo Utah water rights um, were identified for funding under that 2.5 billion. So I just wanted to stop there and thank you for um, hearing our unique story associated with our water challenges and opportunities. Great, thank you panelists, that was very informative. Uh, attendees, if you have any additional questions, feel free to start dropping them into the Q&A function, but I will answer a couple that we have already. So what can we all be doing to further this cause and ensuring clean access for all peoples? It's open to any of the panelists. I always like to say, you know, just educating yourself about it helps and because then you're able to go and use your vote power and reach out to your representatives, especially on areas like this where the federal government does play such a big role um, and there is the opportunity for state governments to do more. And so looking at what's your state policies right now, what are the relations right now with the state and the tribes and how can you reach out to your representatives, your con you know, congressional representatives and tell them as your constituent, these things matter. You know, what's really interesting is there was a little survey recently done um, of different like cross groups to ask the question of, you know, do you support additional funding for water infrastructure projects in Indian country? And it was very high, yes, you know, politically, whether you're a Republican, whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a native, non-native, across all of the different groups, it's an issue that's generally well supported. Again, I think because of, it's just such a human rights issue and something people can get behind, but there are political barriers still very much in the way. And so I encourage, you know, educate yourself and hold your representatives accountable. 
I think understanding the issues is important. So having an understanding, you know, across the Navajo Nation or across the nation saying, you know, that there are water quality challenges, there may be production challenges, there may be um, operation and maintenance challenges associated with the infrastructure that exists, but having an understanding that the scale may vary. I mean, rural communities may have different challenges than urban areas. And thinking about, you know, even just the eastern side of the United States versus the western side, there's unique challenges associated there. So having an understanding of what, you know, first, do you know where your water come from? And second, you know, are you aware of what your water challenges are in your area? What are the unique opportunities that may exist? Because there are great um, solutions that can come from interdisciplinary approaches to providing answers for water challenges. I, I totally agree with um, both your uh, statements regarding this. I think recognizing that we don't all have the same access right now is the first step to improve things and improve our way of, of, of thinking and also to make sure that the different government uh, whether in the United States, uh, in Canada, or even elsewhere, um, that this is an important uh, problem and that needs to be recognized by everyone from every single person to governments. But if people are not even aware of these problems, um, it's hard to, to make change, right? Absolutely. So the next question is, what changes can we make to the infrastructure to make things more efficient? And that can be what impacts can people make, what impacts can the government may be making, and grassroots organizations? What are two scientists comment on kind of the infrastructure <laughs> hydrology component, but at least from like a governance standpoint, right, the, the fractured programs, um, something we're really pushing for, and you've heard Biden's administration use is this term of whole government. Right. So let's all work together, combine our expertise. Some of the projects that we found that were most successful were when agencies would each contribute what they could under their. So EPA was able to bring in money to address right, like a quality concern. USDA brought in money that was able to look at like economic growth, something that some of the other agencies can't. And so you can overcome the caps or limitations of each agency as an individual and just be more effective. But moving forward, there's no mandate right now to do that. I just didn't put in one. And so that's something we're kind of pushing for is there should be an enforceable mandate and some accountability measures would improve it. Yeah, love to hear about more of the <laughs> system approach. <laughs> So if, if I jump in for from my side in Canada, we have um, different things. So even um, for the different indigenous communities that we do have in, um, in Canada, uh, the regulation and government's uh, issues are not the same for First Nation communities and Inuit communities. So that brings also different problems because we don't have the same regulation. So when we talk about uh, drinking water issues in First Nation communities, then we're thinking about federal administration. But when we are uh, talking about uh, Inuit communities that live remotely, then we have this provincial agreements. And so the province, uh, for example, province of Quebec, then take care of uh, regulation for uh, Nunavik, which is the northern portion of Quebec, uh, where um, Inuit communities um, live. So um, those different issues in terms of like who, who take care of which communities, for example, in Canada uh, brings a lot of confusion, but also a lot of um, financial or administrative uh, issues. And in terms of infrastructure, so I was saying earlier, yeah, we cannot have for example, uh, pipe water um, when we have permafrost because it's it's difficult, but also because it's expensive. But if we 
can put money elsewhere, that would be a place where we should put money as well, right? So even if it's more expensive, then this should also work because we also have some issues with truck to cisterns because when the trucks are broken, so if you follow a bit um, Canadian news, uh, some communities have issues when the trucks are broken. And so piece to actually repair those trucks needs to come from Southern Canada and it's very, very difficult to reach um, those communities that are only flying communities. So we have many, many issues that relates to the actual infrastructure in place. And people mostly rely on untreated uh, available natural source that are um, located on the land uh, for many reasons, may also um, because it's ancestral practice, but also because they don't necessarily trust this, the truck to cistern system. So although we may want to bring new infrastructure, for example, pipe supply, it may not be the good solution as well. So at the end, we need to ensure that people do have safe water at home um, and make sure that people don't get sick because of, of water quality issues. Um, and that doesn't necessarily imply having a pipe supply. It can imply as well having good treatment practice at home and making sure that people do have uh, reliable access. In the Navajo Nation, how we're trying to make the infrastructure more efficient is by building new infrastructure and also trying to use good quality material when we build infrastructure, because even some of the infrastructure that we currently have in the Navajo Nation is outliving its lifetime. Uh, and with that also being said, the other thing that we're doing is interconnecting public water systems. Um, by interconnecting the public water system, we're um, better creating efficiency for sustainability purposes, providing more water security for Navajo Nation communities and being able to um, you know, work collectively together makes our practices better uh, as far as you know, having the different developers that are developing water. So Navajo Nation Department of Water Resources does bulk water supply a development, we have the Indian Health Services, which mainly does connection to homes. And then for operation and maintenance, we have Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. But it began when, again, when you begin to think about the infrastructure developing, you also have to consider the operation and maintenance um, costs associated with that. So who will be uh, paying for that to occur? and you know, the upkeep of that. And when you have a population that is you know, in the poverty area of how their living conditions are, it's difficult to be able to drive up a lot of the fees either for electrical or for water when your population um, has challenges associated with the socioeconomic factors. Okay, and then our last question. Uh, the attendee is curious if you could each speak to the different water allocation and trading schemes, especially as droughts, conflicts, economic changes, and other tensions occur. Is there a certain water market or water legal system that we should be moving towards? It's <laughs> a good question. I don't know that we can. I mean, I'm going to just drop in a storyline. So this is kind of a current issue where and i don't know if only he the person was able to see it or if everybody could see it if you can't you can google you know the colorado river indian tribes right now um, has been wanting to be able to lease some of their water rights so if we're looking in the basin um, which is kind of what more i'm most familiar of with the colorado river basin the tribes have a significant amount of the water rights. Not all of those have been settled and quantified, you know, but it's estimated that the 30 tribes across the basin hold about 20% of the water rights, right? So that's a lot of water. And I guess the one thing I really wanna make clear though is when we are talking about drinking water and sanitation, that's such a small percentage. And that's why we really have been pushing like, 
it, it really is different from climate change responses. Um, and because everyone needs that water and that's not where the real concern is, but certainly, right, there is climate change. And when we were dealing with agricultural systems, um, yes, that is. And some people are in discussions and trying to think about how tribes, what role they can play and things like water leasing um, and these other kind of conservative mechanisms. So that's, it's a, I think it's a, a newer concept, right? And part of the challenge there is because many tribes have not Set of settled and quantified their rights and it's being held up and it's a very long process with state negotiations and sometimes states are wanting to impose restrictions on tribes get them to waive other rights in order to settle the rights and if you google around you'll find out what states i'm talking about um, but yeah i just say you know read that article and that might be something that touches on the issue I don't know if Crystal has something else to add on the. Yeah, I, so I mentioned the the hundred year anniversary of the Colorado River Basin, basically um, the first signing of that. And when we began to think about those challenges, and I mentioned the drought persisting in this Colorado River Basin as well. And I mean, the forecasting for the future doesn't look good. I mean, that doesn't look to seem to there's relief on the horizon associated with more snowpack, snowmelt runoff, water contributing to the overall um, system. And with that being said, there are different approaches that are currently being conducted to be able to address drought in the area. But when you begin to think about the, the infrastructure that is set up to be able to address it, where it was largely like a federal and state um, interaction of being able to provide management recommendation and tribes are left out. Uh, there's not a great process for inclusion of tribal nations within the Colorado River Basin, which, you know, there's great opportunity that can exist there. Uh, there so with that being said, you know, tribes are con uh, considering you know, participating in different efforts like the drought response operations plan, the tribes already in December uh, are participatory in the 500 plus plan. And there's great need for overhaul of the way the, you know, there's an expectation of like 7.48 million acre feet from the upper basin to go to the lower basin, but then you consider drought. And if you don't have that available water supply that needs to make it down all the way to Mexico, then, I mean, what do you do? And so the drought and climate change impacts like the drought are encouraging us to think innovatively like that the infrastructure and what's been set in stone through the law of the river needs to be able to be um, something that is able to change as we progress forward. And there's opportunity in that as Heather had described with the Colorado River Indian tribes, there's other discussion of tribes that are along the river that, you know, those conversations can be had. Another example is the Hickory Apache Nation. If you look at what they've done with the state of New Mexico, as well as the Nature Conservancy, you can have a, you know, an understanding of the opportunity for partnership and collaboration during times of drought and what answers may lie and what I said innovatively interdisciplinary approaches are the great opportunity that we have at this time where you know conversations occur outside the decision making room so that these conversations can and um, be included in the decision making room so more conversation with diverse stakeholders is key to answering some of these unique challenges that we may have related to water. Okay, I think we are at time. So I just wanna thank you panelists again. This was very informative. I'm sure the attendees learned a lot. Um, attendees, if you have any questions about this panel, you can email askpilk at gmail.com. I'll be sure to pass on any information you have to the panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>